Okay, welcome back as we're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through Acts chapter 4. And I'm Robert Breaker, and last time we stopped here all around verse 12, but we'll probably go back to verse 10 and start from there today. And last time we looked at the church and what the body of Christ is and how all these Jews that got saved, they got saved into the body of Christ. And, and I showed you last time how there were 8,000, it says, that got saved. Where was that? It was in verse... Um, Oh, no, 5,000. There were 5,000 in verse 4 that believed. So we're reading in this chapter where Peter is preaching and 5,000 people believe. When we go back to Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, and here's what happened. Uh, then you had 3,000 who believed. Acts 2, 41, and we read, And they that gladly received his word were baptized the same day that were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So 5,000 plus 3,000 is 8,000. So that's 8,000 souls that are already believing in who Jesus is. And they're believing in that name. And we're going to see today just how important it is to believe on the name of Jesus. It's all about that name for some reason. Now, we're also going to kind of read between the, the lines. There's a lot going on in this book of Acts. And as I read it, I read it over and over and over and over and over. And God shows me more and more and more and more and more every time. And there's a lot of things going on if you'll just take time and just meditate on what's really taking place here, because it's pretty amazing. And what's going on? Well, chapter 4, the Pharisees come along, and they laid hands on Peter, and uh, I guess it was John who was with them. In verse 2, they laid hands on him. Uh, verse 3, they laid hands on him. And then they, which is, by the way, kidnapping, they basically kidnapped him, and so then they go and they... Um, they try to have like a little mock trial with these guys, and we read that last time. And uh, they ask this question, verse seven: When they had set them in the midst, they asked them, "Well, by what power, but what name, or by what name have you done this?" And uh, I said last time that they're asking that was kind of like insinuating, "So who gave you this power to go heal people? What's his name?" Like insinuating, "So you guys got a devil? Who's the devil that helps you do these miracles?" Because we read in other places of Acts where there's a magician, and so he can do tricks and magicians, and, and we know that it's devils that do that. So it's almost like these religious leaders, these lost religious leaders are saying, so what demon do you have, Mr. Peter, to go around and heal people? Well, what does Peter say? Peter speaks up there in verse 8, and then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, you rulers of the people, the elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, Peter says, look, I'm going to address you politicians, you, you false religious leaders, but I also want everyone here to hear. Now, are those 8,000 there? I don't know. There certainly were probably a lot of lost people there as well. So this might have been in front of 11, 12,000 people. This was a big deal. This wasn't just some little thing that happened in some little church somewhere on the corner. This was happening in downtown Jerusalem, and all of Jerusalem was aware of what was going on here. And Peter says in verse 10, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel. Remember, the first couple of chapters, all the way out to, to chapter 7, the first seven chapters are all about the Jews. So he says it again, be it known unto you and all the people of Israel. Remember, the first seven chapters of Acts are only the Jews. You can't take that doctrine there and try to force it to us today with Paul's teachings. Okay, Acts 2.38 is not the gospel of salvation for today, 1 Corinthians 15.1-4 is. But it says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him did this man stand here before you whole. So the man that got healed, the lame guy, he comes out there. He's there too. And they're examining this, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the priests. And they're looking at this. And, they're, and Peter says, look, Jesus Christ. Now notice what he says, by the name of Jesus Christ. So Peter invokes the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is a compound word. Jesus. J is short for Jehovah. And Seus is the Greek for saves. Well, Jehovah is the God of the Old Testament. So Peter is telling him, like I said, you've got to read between the lines sometimes. The great God and Savior, the creator of the universe... He's the only one that can heal us and resurrect from the dead. So you Pharisees, you religious leaders, you liars, and I told you last time that these religious leaders, what did they do? 
they were the ones that, that went around telling everybody to kill Jesus. So they were murderers. And they were kidnappers. Now what we're going to find, there's a long list of their sins. Because they were corrupt. You've got to be careful when leaders get in power and become corrupt. They abuse their power. What did they do? They laid hold on them and they put them in hold. Verse 3, they put them in a hold. So they kidnapped them and, and against their will kept them somewhere. And now, in verse 10, it says, Be it known unto you, to all the people of Israel, but by the name of Jesus Christ. He doesn't just call him Jesus, his name. He gives him a title. The, Christ is not a name. Christ is a title. The title of Jesus is Christ. The title is Anointed One. That's what Christ means, the Anointed One. We say Messiah. In English, that's from the Hebrew word, mes, me, I can't even spell it, <laughs> Mashiach, so I'm not going to even try, but Messiah. So Jesus Christ is the Messiah. So Peter is sitting here telling these religious leaders, he's schooling the lost religious leaders, telling them, look, the very one that the law and the prophets point to has come, and you murdered him. Then you kidnapped me, and now you're trying to tell me that I've got a demon? What? You're the murderer. You're the liar. You're the filthy ones. You can't accept that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. You need to be saved. Verse 12. Neither is there any salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. So again, he invokes that name. It's all about the name of Jesus in the early book of Acts and having to believe in the name of Jesus. So we see here how Peter responds back. To the rulers of Israel. Reminds them of the healing miracle that took place in chapter 3. He said that it was by Jesus' name that he did that stuff. The power that he had to heal did not come from himself or a demon or a devil. It came from the Christ, from the very Messiah that Israel was supposed to be waiting for. And you know, you read your Bible, you go back to the book of Daniel. Daniel made a prophecy of when Messiah the Prince would come. And he said it's going to be in 483, and then there was a last week, so it's a 490 prophecy. But it talked about the Messiah coming. Every Jewish leader read their Bible. If they had just looked at the prophecy of Daniel and said, okay, I'm going to count the days, they would have seen to the birth of Christ exactly. They would have seen exactly that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. But they said, nah, we don't want to believe that. Now there's a question that I have is why wouldn't they believe that Jesus was the Messiah? Why were they so envious of Christ? Why did they want to kill Jesus? And, uh, well, I'm not going to get into that uh, right now, but um, it could be because they knew their religion was a farce. I've got here in my Bible something that I read one day, and it was a note in my Bible, and it kind of made me wonder. So let me see if I can find that. I went there, so I might as well finish. <laughs> And I was reading this in my Bible, and I said, what? What? I thought this was so wild. All right, look, I, I think I found what I wanted to read. I'm going to throw this out here. I'm not saying that I believe this or don't believe this. But I was reading in the notes in the back of my Bible one day, and these notes were put out by a guy named, oh, uh, J.B. Burney, whoever he is, Ph.D., and uh, he says this, and I thought this was quite interesting. Let me read this. Alexander Janaeus died in the year 78 ABC, leaving two, uh, BC, leaving two sons, the elder Hyracanus, a man of weak character, and Restobulus, a restless, ambitious schemer. Hyracanalus, however you say his name, succeeded, but in a short time, Aristobulus had a sufficient following to wrest the government from his brother's hands. Now this is uh, while the Romans were in control of Israel. Hyracanus would have passed peacefully into oblivion had not persons interested in having a weak man on the Jewish throne offered him their help. Prominent among these was Antipater, governor of Idumea, the father of Herod the Great. He encouraged Hyracanus to resist his brother's usurpation and raised an army to assist him. Soon the country was plunged in the horrors of civil war. The conflict was at its height when Pompey, the German general, appeared on the scene. He perceived that in the divided condition of the country, it, its conquest would be easy. 
He laid siege to Jerusalem in 65 BC, all right, 65 before Christ, and after a, sea, a fierce struggle, captured it. To the horror of pious Jews, the irreverent Gentile forced his way into the Holy of Holies to discern what it was that the Jews worshipped. He found it absolutely empty and was not a little mystified at his discovery. Now, when I read that in my notes, I kind of went, what? Here's what the uh, Jewish temple looks like. All right, This is the Jewish temple, and, it, and it's divided into several parts. And in the very back of the Jewish temple is what's called the Holy of Holies. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be. All right, now, when Jesus showed up, he was born in zero, I guess. I mean, for, from our calendar, but there is no such thing as zero. So he died in 33 AD, they tell us. But in 65 BC, according to history, a guy showed up who was a Roman. He got a hold of this temple, and he went into the Holy of Holies. He opened it up, and he looked in there, and he said it was empty. Now, I've always wondered about that. If that's true, and I don't know, that's why I'm not teaching this dogmatically, but if it was true, it wasn't there. The entire Jewish religion would have been a farce if that was true. And Jesus would have known this. So when Jesus showed up and he preached against the Pharisees, he knew that they were liars because they didn't even have the Ark of the Covenant. They weren't even following the Old Testament law once a year, bringing into the Holy of Holies the blood to forgive the people of Israel. Now, again, I don't know that. I was kind of surprised when I found that in my notes. And uh, I was able to read other notes that go way back to um, Antiochus of Epiphanes and how he went in several times and, and uh, was able to take over way before that. So the Bible says, under the law, if you know the Old Testament law, the Bible says that the priests, the religious leaders, were supposed to go into that and offer up the blood, but only the high priest once a year. So no one would ever have gone into this building. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, there's a place where a guy went into the Holy of Holies and God killed him dead. He said no one's ever allowed in there except for one man, ever. And that's the high priest. So the high priest, was it like a... I don't know, I'm trying to explain this. Was it in the time of Jesus that when Jesus showed up, he knew that the religious leaders were liars? They knew that they were running a scam on the people, claiming to offer forgiveness of their sins, claiming to be following the law, but they didn't even have the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know. I'm not going to say that 100% that that's what happened. Um, I, I, reading through the Bible, I think that the Ark of the Covenant was hidden by um, Jeremiah and uh, since the captivity of Babylon. So it probably it's been quite a long time that the Jews hadn't had their, their uh, covenant. So I'm looking at history and I'm looking at this note, this historical note from this guy, and who knows if it's true or not. But if it is true, then Jesus Christ, the reason that he was against the religious leaders and called them hypocrites is because they didn't even have the Ark of the Covenant to begin with. And they're telling all of Israel, come unto us for salvation. Let us save you because we can save you through the blood. Because you know they'd offered up the blood into the Holy of Holies, but no one could ever see if they did that. What if they didn't even have the Ark of the Covenant? So that was all a lie. Well, then it starts to make sense. So that's why Jesus was so against the religious leaders. Because there's a lot, there were a bunch of liars claiming to be the only true religion, but they didn't even have the very thing that they were supposed to have to put the blood on to complete their religion. And that would explain, if it's true, and like I said, I don't know, why they wanted Jesus killed, because they knew he knew their secret. <gasps> he knows the secret that we don't even have the Ark of the Covenant. We're lying to the people and telling them that we're offering up for their forgiveness of their sins once a year in, in that Holy of Holies, and we don't even have the place we're supposed to. <laughs> so just a thought. But if that's the case, then you go over here, look at what he's telling these people. Back to Acts chapter 4, he says, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. We must be saved. So he's telling these religious leaders, look, you're not even saved. 
He's saying, you look a bunch of hypocrites. You must be saved. You need salvation, you lost religious people. You're going around telling the people of Israel that you're the ones that God chose to help them find forgiveness of their sins through a blood atonement. And you don't even have the thing that you're supposed to offer the blood atonement on. So I don't know. I'm not saying that that is 100% what it was, that that was the fact, that there was no um, Ark of the Covenant, and so there was no sacrifice in there. I don't know. But I thought it was interesting that in my Bible there was a note about that from some guy. So it could be. It could be that Jesus came to offer himself for the forgiveness of sins for the people of Israel because the people he put in charge, the religious leaders, weren't even given the sacrifice like they were supposed to. Now, they would still do the sacrifice out, out in, the, in the front for each individual, but the sacrifice for the nation. See, that's what this was, once a year for the entire nation. That wasn't being done. So Jesus Christ became the sacrifice for the nation. Now, go back to our study on Hebrews for more on that, and you'll see the difference between the sacrifice for the individual and the once yearly sacrifice for the nation. So I, I read that note, and I thought, well, that would be so something. Wouldn't that be interesting? that these Pharisees were pretending to be the religious leaders, and yet they didn't even have a religion because the very thing that they were supposed to have, the Ark of the Covenant, to offer the blood on, to do the blood atonement for the sins of the entire nation, they didn't even have. No wonder. Now it makes sense why Jesus would have called them hypocrites. So here we go. He's preaching to these religious leaders, and he says, Be it known unto you all and to the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God has raised him from the dead. So they're kidnappers. Uh, they kidnap these two to have a, a little fake trial. They're murderers. He tells them, you guys, you killed Jesus. They're hypocrites. That's what Jesus called them. A bunch of hypocrites. And now look at what he says here in verse 11. This is the stone which is, was set at not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. All right, so what Peter is saying here is a quote from an Old Testament verse. Peter is quoting from Psalms 118, 22. So let's go back. And again, as we read through Acts, whenever somebody quotes something from an Old Testament verse, let's read that whole chapter because it's pertinent to what he's saying. Psalms 118, verse 22, look at what the Bible says. And that's one chapter before the longest chapter in the whole Bible, Psalm 119. Psalm 118.22, the stone which the builders refused has become the head of the, storm, the, the corner. This is a prophetical verse about Jesus Christ. Now, let's read the entire chapter and see what Peter is telling them, because these Pharisees would have known this chapter, and they would have remembered that verse when he quoted it, and they would have remembered all the context. So what is Psalms 118? And does it apply to these false, corrupt, lying hypocrites, religious leaders? Psalms 118, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endures forever. Yeah, we should give thanks to God, always. Let Israel now say that his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endures forever. The house of Aaron, well, that's where the Levitical priesthood comes from, from the house of Aaron. He was from the tribe of Levi. <laughs> so those religious leaders were all Levites. They should say, oh, um, his mercy endures, endures forever. Uh, verse um, 4, let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endures forever. Now that's what they didn't have. Those religious leaders didn't fear the Lord. They should have. They should have. I have called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Verse 5. Verse 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? 7, the Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therein shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. Uh, verse 6 is very good. What can man do unto me? That's almost like Peter saying, hey, what are you going to do to me? I haven't done anything wrong. I healed the guy. What sin is that? It's, it's interesting how you go back to the old verses that are quoted, and there's so much that seems to apply to what's in the New Testament. Verse 8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Verse 9, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. So Peter, is this Peter trying to insinuate by going back and quoting this passage of Scripture? Hey, remember, I'm not going to trust in you. I'm trusting in the Lord. Verse 10, all nations compass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compass me about, yea, they compass me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. This is God speaking through, through David. Say, hey, the nations tried to kill me. I'm going to destroy them. God says, I'm going to destroy the nations someday. 
Verse 12, they compass me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and has become my salvation. David is saying, the Lord is my salvation. Peter, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, says, Jesus Christ is your salvation, and you must be saved, because there's no salvation outside of the Lord, the very Lord that David is speaking about in this psalm. Verse 15, the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacle of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doth valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord unto which the righteous shall enter, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. Then we have verse 22 that he quoted, The stone which the builders refused has become the head of the stone of the corner. Headstone of the corner. Verse 23, This is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Well, that's what they were wanting. They were, were preaching Christ so that Jesus could come now and set up the millennial kingdom. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even the horns of the altar. Verse 28. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. So, quite interesting that Peter is speaking to these religious Pharisees, and we know the Holy Spirit is in him speaking. And the Holy Spirit says, now, I'm quoting Psalms 118.22. So your idea should be, well, I'm going to go read Psalm 118, and it's talking about Jesus being salvation. And then in verse 12, Paul says in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby ye must be saved. What is the name? The name is Jesus. But in the Old, Old uh, Testament, back in that psalm, it's talking about the Lord. That's why Paul refers to Jesus Christ as the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why Peter calls him the Lord. So, <clears throat> verse uh, 13, now we go back to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So, Peter and John weren't the smartest cookies. <laughs> they weren't learned in the sense that Paul was. Paul was a lawyer. Uh, Peter was just a fisherman. They didn't know much. But they knew enough that they were going to stand up and say what they knew. And they knew that they killed Jesus, but that God raised him from the dead, and that the only way to be saved is how? Through the name of Jesus. So look what he says there in verse 10. Be it known to you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus. Verse 12. There's no other name under heaven whereby you must be saved. Go back to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 and verse 15. This sounds a lot like what he's saying in Acts 3.15. And killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead, where we are witnesses. Well, he just told them in, in Acts 4.10 that they killed Jesus, they crucified him, and God raised him from the dead. Verse 16, and his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong. So this message of, of Peter is faith in the name of Jesus. It's all about believing in the name. So again, I say it's the who gospel. All believing about who Jesus is. And that the truth for us today is the gospel of Paul. It's all about trusting in what Jesus did. Now, after the rapture, it goes back to the Jews, and the same message will be preached, who Jesus is, trusting in his name, and such like. So back to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. So they, they marveled at these guys, because they're like, how could these guys be saying this? They're not learned in the scriptures. So like I say, when you read the book of Acts, you have to read between the lines. All Peter did was quote one verse in verse 11. But... It sounds like the way they took it was Peter wasn't just saying that one verse. He was quoting the whole chapter. And the whole chapter has to do with the salvation coming of the Messiah coming. So it's like these, these Pharisees were saying, he's not just saying that Jesus died and rose again. He's saying that he was the Christ, that he was the Messiah. That's why in verse 10 it says the name of Jesus Christ. Remember that Christ is the title. So it's so easy to just quickly read through the book of Acts and not catch this, but as you scrutinize it, as you read it, you clearly see that Paul is preaching that Jesus was the Messiah. 
And it gets even clearer as we continue. And that the Jews had to believe that they killed their Messiah. Now, verse 14. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. All right, so they could say nothing against what um, happened, what Peter did in healing this fella. They could not deny the miracle that took place. All they wanted to know was from what power and from what name. Verse 7. This is what the Pharisees asked. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked them, By what power or by what name have you done this? And Peter says, I did it by the power of Almighty God in the name of Jesus, the Christ of Nazareth, the Messiah. He is the head which the builders rejected. And He is salvation. Now, you go back to uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse 15. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. So these religious leaders all got together and they began to talk. And I mean to go, well, we're murderers. We're kidnappers. We're hypocrites. We, if this is true, we don't even have an Ark of the Covenant. If the people ever found out and they knew who we were, why we'd, we'd be in trouble. What they should have done right there was says, let's just get down on our knees and just accept Jesus Christ and let him come back right there and set up his kingdom. But they didn't. No, they didn't. No, they, they loved their power. They loved their position. And they didn't want to give it up. So look what they did. Verse 16, saying, so they, got, they, they told them to leave and they got aside in their own little council and they spoke together, the religious leaders, the politicians, saying, what shall we do to these men? For, for that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. We can't deny that this lame man is now walking around and that he was healed. So they said it was a miracle. That they, 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 that's their confession. They confessed, hey, we saw a miracle, but they didn't believe. You see, they're not believing in the name. It's all about believing in the name, the early book of Acts. So they chose not to believe, but they confessed that it took place. They said, yeah, yeah, there was a miracle. Verse 17, but that it spread no farther among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. So now what did they do? Now they go along and they threaten someone. Well, they sound like a stinking mafia. They sound like Don Corleone, Cor Corleone or whatever that guy's name. I never watched Godfather. People tell me it's a good movie. It's so boring. But they're, they say, what are we going to do? Well, well, we'll threaten these guys. Because we're the religious leaders. We're the ones in charge here. We don't like what they're saying. Well, they're reminding people that we murdered Jesus. Well, we're going to have to shut them up. So did they humble themselves and come to Jesus? Nope. They doubled down and said, that's it. We will not let these guys continue. It said, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in his name. So what did they do? They tried to suppress their speech. They tried to take away free speech. Now when you see what these religious leaders are doing, you clearly see the death of a nation. United States of America, we're seeing the same thing take place in our country. We are seeing communist, progressive, uh, uh, socialist, liberals trying to take over our country. And they want to suppress our free speech. And they threaten us. And they're, they want to murder us and kidnap us, but before they can get there, they try to tell us what we can and can't say. It's the same corrupt crowd that wants power and authority, and yet they're corrupt. So what do they do? Well, they make threats. Verse 16, it says that a notable miracle have been done, and we can't deny it. So verse 17, since we can't fight it, well, let's threaten them. It says, but that it spread no farther among the people, verse 17, let us straightly, straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Don't mention the name of Jesus, whatever you do. Why? That's the name they gave the power to heal. Why would you not want that? In verse 18, and they called them and commanded them to, to speak, not to speak. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. All right, so they said, don't speak. Take away their free speech. And don't talk. They tried to control their speech. If Americans give in to this communist crap, garbage, evil, 
that's trying to take over our country. There will be a day in which a Christian won't have any right to speak and teach the gospel or to preach the Bible. That's what they're trying to take away. And that's what they're working hard at doing today. And we're seeing the progressive Democratic Party and all these uh, Maoists trying to do the same thing. They're the same wicked religious leaders as the people in the time of Jesus and Peter. So they told them, look, you can't teach. No teaching. Don't talk. Don't even teach. Why? To, to teach? Why, well, you have to be a certified state-trained teacher. And so if you'll come to the state and let us teach you in college, we'll tell you what you can and can't say. Political correctness. <laughs> I'm reading the Bible and I'm like, what a parallel, man. We're seeing the same thing today. They're trying to shut up Christians with the exact same agenda. And they're doing the same thing, trying to threaten us, take away our speech, tell us what we can and can't say. So, here's what happened. Verse 18. And they called them, okay, so they called Peter and John, and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. They said, you can't do this. Now, what did Peter say? We see the defiant attitude of Peter. Peter says, I'm not going to listen to you. Who do you think you are, you bunch of hypocrites? That's what Jesus called them. He said, no, I cannot follow you or obey you because you are murderers. So you see, when a corrupt leader is in charge, and he's so corrupt that he is not lawful, he's not keeping the law, then you have to do right by not obeying him. Um, one of the founding fathers of America was Benjamin Franklin. He said, uh, 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 disobedience to tyranny is obedience to God. What was he saying? You can never obey someone who's disobeying Jesus, disobeying God. You can never obey someone and do something wrong. Laws should never be passed that make you sin and go against your conscience. So here we find Peter giving us an example of when a man tells you that you can't do the ministry, the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God, then you can't obey that man. I don't care who he is. And so he says here, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, verse 19, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than to, unto God, judge ye. Verse 20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Peter basically stands up and says, I don't care what you say. You judge. Should I do what you say, or should I do what God says? Do I speak what God tells me to say, or do I shut up and not say because you say not to? He said, you judge. What would you do? I like how he says that. You judge. You judge you. Which is better, to speak what God says in the sight of man, or to say nothing because you said so, and by the way, you're not God. I just love the way that Peter speaks to these people. So Peter's defiant attitude shows Basically saying, who should we obey, God or man? Peter says he cares only about testifying of what he's seen. He's like, I'm only going to say what I see. I'm only going to speak the truth. What do they want him to do? Lie. You cannot lie because the government says so. As a Christian, you should always tell the truth. So it's just it's amazing to see how today we see the government... When, when corrupt people get in, why they want to silence their opposition. Sometimes they murder them or kidnap them. But they begin by threatening them and taking away their free speech and saying, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. And the way to get along with them is to lie. And Peter says, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to tell the truth. And you guys can't do anything about it. And he stood up to them. What did they do? Verse 21, so when they had further threatened them... They let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them. All right, so what they do, they even threaten them even more, and then they desire to punish them. Who is it that wants to punish? The guilty party, the murderous, kidnapper, hypocrite, liars, who are trying to take away free speech, who are lying, who are threatening, who are evil. They're trying to punish the good. And we see that when evil gets power, it wants to punish the good. And the right thing to do, according to the Bible, is to speak the truth and tell the truth and preach the gospel and teach the Word of God. So when they had farther, further threatened them and let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. So these religious Pharisees, they still were afraid of the crowd. And you know, there's 8,000 at least against how many Pharisees? Maybe 100, 200, 300, who knows how many there were. But the majority saw the truth. 
The minority was against the truth, and the minority was in power. That's called an oligarchy. Um, I've read many years ago Plato's Republic. I don't know if you've ever read that. It's interesting. Uh, pa Plato wasn't saved, so I, I'm, I don't like the guy. I'm not recommending you read him. But he would, uh, in that book, he would say that governments work in cycles. It starts as republic. In a republic, laws govern. Everyone follows the law. Then it degrades into a democracy. A democracy is mob rule. In a democracy, the people vote on what they want to be the law. And if you can sway people into, into passing a dishonest or an evil or a wicked law, then everyone has to obey it. No, it shouldn't be that way. And then a small group takes power and takes over, and that's called the oligarchy. And Plato said that an oligarchy always ends up in a dictatorship. All right, you look at the United States of America. It was founded as a republic. Every single day, all over the news, all over newspapers, what do you hear? And the democracy, our democracy, the democracy of the United States. No, America is not a democracy. It's a republic. But what are they trying to do? The socialists, the progressives, the, the, the communists are a small group. There's more Americans that aren't communists than those there are. But the communists are doing this to try to take over power, the oligarchy, the, 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 the minority, so that they can set up a dictatorship. So they threaten people. They tell people, well, politically correct, you can't say this, you can't teach that, you can't say this. Do you see how that works? You can never give in to an oligarchy. You can never give in to the communist because they're not of God. You must have freedom of speech. And you must speak what you know is true. All right, so verse 21, they threatened them even more. But they found nothing to punish them. Shows that they wanted to punish. They wanted to punish these men because they were in charge, even though they were the minority. They wanted to say, no, we're in charge and you can't do what we say. They wanted to hurt them. But God protected them. Now, verse 22. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Now, why does the Bible tell us the age of the man who was healed? The lame man. I don't know. But in context, you've got these evil, wicked, corrupt religious leaders wanting to find something, anything, on the early apostles that they could use against them in order to put them in jail to where they could beat them and punish them and, and, and imprison them to shut up their influence and to shut up their mouth. So, if it had been a young boy, do you think maybe they would have said, oh, you guys, you're just so evil while you're abusing young, young people. <laughs> Isn't it funny that that's always one of the first things that the evil, wicked people try to say? against a good person. Well, you're a child molester. <laughs> what? You know, one of the worst things that a person in this world could be is someone that hurts a child. So what these evil, wicked, corrupt religious leaders do is they want to think, what's the worst person, worst thing that a person could be, and then how could I try to make people think that that's what this person is? Because if I could get them to think that he's one of them, well, then they'd never listen to what they have to say. And so that's what they do. They try to make you, people think you're a child molester or you beat up children or you're a woman, a wife beater or you're a, 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 you know, anything. And so what it is is the guilty, the evil, lie about the good and say things that aren't true. Christians just tell the truth. Conservatives need to stand up and tell the truth always because the truth will always prevail. All right, verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priest and elder had said unto them. So the exact opposite of what they were told to do by their religious leaders, they did the opposite. They didn't shut up. They didn't allow their free speech to be taken. taken. Rather, they said everything. They witnessed what they saw. And they said, this is what they did. Truth will always prevail. Never allow anyone to silence your speech, ever, especially a political organization. Always stand up for what's right and say what's right. And now verse 24, When they heard that that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Okay? So here we go. They, when they heard that, who's the they that heard that? Well, these 8,000 believers, other believers in Christ, the early church. When they heard what happened to Peter and John, 
they lifted up their voice and they said, Truly, God, you are the Creator God. What were they saying? They're saying, You're the Lord. You're the Creator. You're the Messiah. You're God manifest in the flesh. And you loved us enough, Mr. Creator, to come down and die in our place. And you rose again. And now you're ready to come back in your kingdom. And we believe that you are God the Creator. So isn't that amazing that they, they accepted who Jesus was? What is his name? Jehovah saves. Jehovah is the creator of the universe. So they, they're trusting in who he is. They're not trusting yet in what he did for them. They're trusting in who he is as the creator of heaven and earth. Now verse 25. Who by the mouth of, the ser of thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? This is a quote of Psalms chapter 2. So let's go to Psalms chapter 2. They're quoting Psalms chapter 2 and verse 1. Now who is quoting this? The early church. The early church only had at that time the Old Testament. So they're going through and reading the Old Testament day after day after day after day after day and they're finding Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And they're saying, man, it's all about Him. And the Pharisees, they can't see it. Pharisees don't see Jesus as the Messiah. They don't want to see it. But he says, one of the heathen rage and the people imagine, imagine a vain thing. Well, here it is in Psalms chapter 2 and verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying. Well, that's the next verse um, in verse 26, I believe, in Acts chapter 4. So it's the two verses that are quoted. Uh, verse 3. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Well, see how this applies to, to what we're reading in Acts? Let us break their bands. What are they trying to do? These religious, reader, uh, religious leaders are trying to uh, put bands there or put cords up, tie them up, try to chain them down, make them slaves to them. No, we're free in Christ. We break free from your evil. You will not govern over us, you, you corrupt political liars. We have the true religious leader. It's Christ. Verse 4, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Who's sitting in heaven? God, Jesus Christ. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. So the wrath of God is going to come upon these people who don't accept Jesus. These corrupt people, they're not going to get away with their corruption. Someday they will pay. And then it says here, verse Six, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee a heathen for thine inheritance, and the othermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with the rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. Trust in Him. So they're to trust in Jesus, waiting for that kingdom to come. Well, the leader's rejected, so the kingdom's way out here now. But we got saved today because of it. And it's a great thing that we Gentiles can be saved today. So back to Acts chapter 4 and verse 25, who by the mouth of servant David said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? That's Psalms 2.1. The kings of the earth stood up, the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. That sounds an awful lot about like verse 2. But I looked at this and I, and I thought to myself, Huh, huh. Acts 4.26, the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were together together against the Lord and his Christ. And I said to myself, Huh. That sounds like uh, Psalms 59. So let's go to Psalms 59. The rulers of this world at that time were who? Rome. So what happened to Jesus? The religious leaders went to Pilate and Herod, who were the religious leaders of the time, or the, the secular leaders, the kings of the earth at the time, at that area, and they joined together to kill Jesus. So the Jewish religious leaders got together with the leaders of the world, the kings of the earth, the kings at that time, and they killed Christ. Psalms 59, and uh, well, let's see. 
Kings of the Earth. Let's see. First. Oh, let's see. Verse 1, Deliver me from mine enemies, O God, and defend them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity, and save me from bloody men. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression, nor for my soul. Here's Jesus speaking through David about those that are against him. The mighty are gathered against him. And we just read in there where he says the kings of the earth are against him. So that made me think of this verse where it says they're against him. Let's just go ahead and read the whole chapter. They run and propel themselves without my fault. Awake to help me, and behold. Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to thy wicked transgressors. Selah. They return at evening. They make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. Behold, they belch out with their mouth words in their lips. For who, said they, doth hear? But thou, O Lord, shalt laugh at that. Thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. Sounds a lot like Psalm chapter 2. Because of his strength will I wait upon thee, for God is my defense. The God of my mercy shall prevent me. God sh shall let me see my desire upon mine enemies. Slay them not, lest my people forget. Scatter them by thy power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride and for cursing and lying which they speak. Sounds like he's talking about those leaders and the religious leaders of Israel who are the hypocrites and the liars and the bad people. 13. Consume them in wrath. Consume them that they may not be. And let them know that God, that God ruleth in Jacob unto the ends of the earth. Selah. And in the evening let them return and let them make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. Let them wander up and down for meat and grudge if they be not satisfied. But I will sing of thy power, yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, and thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing, for God is my defense, and God, the God of my mercy. So, a lot of times as you're reading through the book of Acts, it sounds like bits and pieces of Psalms, showing that the early church would have read their Bible and have known what it said. So, we go back there to verse 27, Acts 4.27, And of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast uh, of 26. Let's go back to verse 26. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So we read some passages in Psalms 2 and in Psalms 59 about them rising up. And who was it? The kings, the rulers. So the religious leaders and the leaders of the day, the secular leaders, were against Christ. Verse 27, For of a truth against thy holy child Christ, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. So as I just stated, the religious leaders joined together with the Gentile leaders and they all crucified Jesus Christ. Now, what is going to happen? Why, why did they do that? Verse 28, For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Verse 29, Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. All right, so here's what's going on here. This is a prayer. They're praying. And he says, and now, Lord. So in verse 29, he begins praying. He says, and now, Lord, please look from heaven at the threatenings that they're doing toward us. And we just ask you, Lord, to fix this situation. So it's kind of neat that as we're reading through here, we're seeing what's taking place, and we're seeing a prayer. They're praying a prayer, and they're praying, Lord, behold the threatenings of those evil people that are against us, and grant unto us, thy servants, Lord, that with all boldness we may speak thy word. Lord, help us to disobey what they said, and not be quiet, and not quit teaching, but give us boldness to even more preach and speak thy word. Verse 30, By stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by thy name, and of thy holy child, Jesus. So they're saying, Lord, please help us to do more miracles so that Israel might believe. Remember Acts, uh, I mean, 1 Corinthians 1.22, Jews seek after a sign. We're still, till we get to about chapter 7, 8, somewhere in there, still only dealing with Jews. Jews need signs to believe. So they're praying, Lord, please help us in your name to be able to do these signs so the Jews might believe. Now verse 31. Verse 31. And when they had prayed... The place was shaken where they were assembled together with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So they prayed for boldness in verse 29, and God gave them boldness in verse 31. And they are filled 
with the Holy Ghost. Now, once you're saved, you get the Holy Ghost, and He stays in you, but you can be filled. That means you, you get more or less, but it, it never leaves you. It's, it's hard to explain what it is to be filled with the Holy Ghost, but you've got the Holy Ghost when you're saved. So it doesn't go and leave and go and leave and go and leave. It's there. But to be filled means you just, it's like you, you're filling a balloon. The balloon has air in it. You got more, you got less, but it always has air in it. So they're filled with the Holy Ghost. But what happened? The place was shaken where they were assembled together. Sounds like an earthquake, sort of. If there was an earthquake at that time, could you imagine these guys? They would have felt it. The religious leaders are all sitting together after they got John and, and, and Peter to go away, and they're, and they're sitting there going, well, we told that guy, man, we're going to... We punished him. We threatened him. Well, he's an idiot. He knows what he's talking about. Telling us that Jesus is the Messiah. What a jerk. And all of a sudden, what's going on? Oh, it's an earthquake. <laughs> you know, how many more signs can they get? So anyway, it says they were all together. They had just prayed for boldness. And then what happened? Verse 31, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. But you know what? It does not say that they spake with tongues. They didn't. They spoke the word of God with boldness. In Hebrew, it doesn't say, and they spoke in tongues. It doesn't say that. It says they spoke the word of God. What does that mean? That means they would have quoted more Old Testament scriptures, like Psalms 2, like Psalms 59, like Psalms um, 100, and oh, I forget what all the other chapters are that talk about Jesus, Psalms 22, and other things. Now verse 32, And the multitude of them, of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which they had possessed was his own, but they had all things common. All right, so they were all together in their belief. Would have been these 8,000, 8,011 really, because there were 11 apostles, or 12, or I don't know. It was, it was over 8,000 people. And this is one of the verses that Karl Marx uses as the foundation of communism. And it says, and they had all things in common. And what did they do? Well, I verse 35, and they laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And so Karl Marx said, well, here's what we ought to do. We ought to just take everything from everybody, put it all in a pile, and give everybody how much they have need for. Well, that is not what the Bible just said. It does not say that we take from everybody. What does it say? They were all of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them ought of the things which he was of his own. But they had all things common. So what did they do? They laid them down at the apostles' feet. They, of their own free will, said, what I have means nothing to me. I'm going to give it all to the church. Why did they do that? Because they thought the Messiah was going to come back and they wouldn't have need of anything. So the whole mindset of, of the communism, or communism, being a commune, is that Jesus is about to come and take care of us. As we read through the book of Acts, and we read the apostles of Paul, we see capitalism. We don't see communism. Paul was in a capitalist society. And as we read through Paul, we find Paul going to different churches and taking up offerings. And he was taking these offerings and he was taking it to other churches and giving it to them as they had a need. But he wasn't telling them, you must give this. It was people of their own free will giving. Communism takes away your free will. Every communist country, they say, we're the government, we're in charge, and you give us everything and then we'll give you what we think you need. And guess who is the richest people in communism? The leaders. Because they're corrupt and they take everything you get that? They take everything. They steal. They're, they're, they're thieves, basically. And they don't give to people as they have need. They give them very little while they themselves keep the most of it. So communism is one of the worst ever political ideals in the history of the world. And it murders people. All communist re regimes start out by threatening, by taking away free speech, by lying, by punishing people, by telling people you can't do this. Those who resist are kidnapped and murdered. So we don't want communism. So what we have here, we have communism. We have the early church together living in a commune in which the people of their own free will come together and say, man, just take what I got, we'll all share. And that's a wonderful thing, but you must have the Holy Spirit first. 
If you get a bunch of lost people together like that, it doesn't always work. Because the sinful lost nature of man is, but I want more! And then there'll be a war. So communism doesn't work. We're not communists. Capitalism works. You go work for what you have. Now, if I have more than you, and you need something, and you're my brother in Christ, well then of my own free will, I'll help you. That's how it works. You don't have a right to come and take what I have. Or go to some government somewhere and say, would you take everything he has and give me some of it? <laughs> go get a job. Go get a working, going to take a place. And it's so rewarding to work and then get something because you earned it. It's not rewarding to just sit around and wait for a handout. It does, it's not good. Because you can always have more by working than you can sitting around in a handout. And communism never gives you enough. That's why every communist regime that's ever taken over a country in, a, in the world has always fallen. Because the people get tired of it and say, this just don't work. The rich get richer and the poor get poor, and we want something. Let us go work for ourselves. We don't want you, government. Because you don't give us enough. So anyway, enough about that. So they, things which they possessed was their own, but they had all things in common. Verse 33, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So God's grace was upon them for them doing right, for speaking out against corruption and saying the opposite of what they were told to say. Because they were told, shut up and don't talk about Jesus. And Jesus said, no, you go tell everyone about me. So they said, we'd rather obey God than me. Verse 34, Neither was there anything among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of houses or lands sold them, and bought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Again, it was a willful giving. It was not a forced taking away. Communism is a forced taking away from everybody. And that's not what the Bible teaches. Yet, that's what Karl Marx saw when he read this verse. He says, oh, I like that. Why, well, we should just take everything from everybody and then just distribute it to everybody. And yet, in his mind, he's thinking, but if I'm in charge, I'll keep a little bit more for me. <laughs> and that's how communism works. The guy in charge gets the most and gets the biggest piece of the pie. I mean, picture it like this. You're on a deserted island with ten people, and all of a sudden you get a pie. And you say, I'm in charge here. I'm the guy that gets to decide who gets the, a piece of pie. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to cut this pie up into eight pieces or however many people there are. And then he, he on, on purpose cuts it to where he gets the biggest piece. And then he gives everybody a piece. And they say, but then no fair, you got a bigger piece. He goes, shut up, I'm in charge here. <laughs> That's communism in a nutshell. The guy in charge gets the biggest piece. Who wants that? That's not fair. It's not fair at all. So anyway... So they willingly came and laid them down with the apostles' feet. Now verse 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So I find this so amazing. Here we have a guy who's a Levite. Why does the Bible say he's a Levite? All the religious leaders, a priest of Israel, the priests came from the tribe of Levi. If you were from the tribe of Levi, you were called a Levite. The priesthood was called the Levitical priesthood. So we're reading in the Bible of something that took place under the ministry of Peter. Peter and John go to the temple. They heal a guy. Eight, uh, 5,000 people see that and believe. The religious leaders come along and say, no, we'll have none of it. And they punish them and persecute them and, and tell them they can't talk about Jesus. They say, yeah, whatever, we're going to do it anyway. And they go. And they start a great church <laughs> in the area. There's 8,000 people all together living in a commune, sharing things. And they're all having a great time. But the Bible says at the end of this chapter, oh, now, by the way, one of the Levites got saved. So let's add one here. All these other people in the book of Acts so far that believed in the name of Jesus, there's 8,000 of them, it doesn't tell us what tribe they were from. But this last part of this verse, it says, by the way, this guy was a Levite. When I look at that, I say, well, I wonder why he's giving us that information. Then I say, oh, yeah, that's right, because the religious leaders were Levitical priests. So it's almost like it's saying of the 
ruling class, only one of them got converted. The rest of them said, I'd rather go to hell than live like that. I'm happy being a ruler. I'm happy in my ruling class. I'm happy doing what I do. And I don't want anything to do with that Jesus. Again, power corrupts absolute power corrupts absolutely. So at least one of those corrupt people was converted. So I think that's interesting how the Bible tells us that. All right, so we'll close there, verse 37. But uh, verse 37 is very important because it's a contrast to verse 1 of chapter 5. Chapter 5 begins, but. So it tells us, it, it contrasts verse 36 and 37 of this Barnabas, or um, this Levite, and how he sold everything he had to give it to the church. And then it gives a contrast of this other guy named Ananias. And how he has sold everything to give it to the church, but yet he lied. He kept back some of it. So he wanted to be looked at as somebody who was a great Christian that gave everything when he didn't give everything. And what happens to him? Well, <laughs> pretty scary. And we'll get to that next time. But I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope you can see uh, what we're reading here. Please remember that the book of Acts is a transitional book. And we're seeing the transition from the Jews to the Gentiles, and we're still only in those chapters in which it's only Jews dealing with Jews. But the takeaway from this chapter is, watch out for leaders. Watch out for those who are in charge. Watch out for politicians, those who say that they have the power. Because if they ever get to the point to where they're so corrupt and so conceited and prideful in which they think they can tell you what to do, and they try to threaten you, or take away your free speech, or tell you you can't talk about Jesus, and they try to, to, to be evil towards you, that's when you do it even more. That's when you say, okay, if that's what you say, then here's what I'm going to do. The Bible says, and you just preach and preach. Don't ever let man keep you from witnessing about Jesus Christ. That's the takeaway from this chapter more than anything else. And also, how they should have believed that Jesus was their Messiah. All right, we'll see you next time. God bless.